to the American Cinema Foundation Movie Podcast. I am your host, Titus, and today I am joined by my friend Eric Cook. We are going back to our discussion of Hitchcock. We have already covered Psycho and the Birds. Now we are going back to the beginning of the period that interests us, roughly from the late 40s through the early 60s. Today we are talking about Rope, the strangest film in the Hitchcock catalog, or at least the American catalog. This is a film that feels and looks like a play. It's an interior drama, it is a thriller, but at the same time it is a study of society that doesn't seem to have a high stake. It is very strange because instead of being a who done it, you know from the beginning who done it and that they done it. All the stakes therefore are moral. There is nothing of detecting required. It's less of a detective movie than the audience might have wanted and more Dostoevsky's crime and punishment. This is not a popular movie, it wasn't a success, and we'd like to lay out what's going on before we explain what's so fascinating about it. Derek, take us through the plot. Uh, thank you, Titus. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and to talk to you about classic film and Hitchcock in particular. This film has its roots in the 1924 Leopold and Loeb murder case. Two University of Chicago boys, Jewish background, upper middle class. One's father was an executive for Sears and Roebuck decided to commit the perfect crime and they murdered a boy, I think it was Robert Franks. They killed him with a chisel and very quickly the Chicago police, in a very mundane way, put everything together and they found themselves in prison. And very famously Clarence Darrow got them out of the electric chair through an impassioned 10 or 12 hour speech, quite a feat of oratory if nothing else. The film comes into existence by the way of a British play written by Patrick Hamilton. So the movie opens in a very Hitchcockian way. And if you've seen Psycho, and we've talked about Psycho before, he has this great shot where he brings a camera up over into a New York City apartment, a sort of penthouse apartment. But the curtains are drawn and we get this horrific scream and we find ourselves inside and we see the murder taking place. There's a character named David, he's played by Dick Hogan, and we'll come back to him when we talk about the trailer. And he's murdered by two prep school former roommates or at least uh, housemates of his, John Dahl and Farley Granger. Granger's actually the one killing him. They have murdered him, just like the source material, for the intellectual thrill and to create a work of art, John Dahl says, and to show their sort of Nietzschean superiority as supermen. They're going to dispose of the body that evening by driving it out to uh, John Dahl's mother's Connecticut farm and uh, dumping it into a lake. But in a moment of what he thinks is genius, John Dahl decides that the body is going to be temporarily deposited in an antique Italian trunk in the sitting room of this very elegant upper middle class apartment. And to showcase their genius and their superiority as Superman, Ubermensch, they're going to invite all the friends and family of the victim together, and they're going to actually serve the meal from the trunk. This is such a macabre idea, and so the uh, candlesticks from the dining room and the dishes are transferred, and this trunk, which is now acting as a coffin, suddenly also becomes a buffet, and then they serve from the sideboard all the guests, which includes the father of the victim, the fiancé of the victim, a friend and former lover of the fiancé, and an aunt who's standing in for the mother who's homesick. But there's another character who's involved, and that's the great Jimmy Stewart, and he plays Rupert Cadell, who is their former housemaster from prep school, who's now gone into publishing. In this dinner party atmosphere, which is supposed to be a going away party for Farley Granger's character, he's a concert pianist who's supposedly going off to Connecticut to prepare himself for his professional concert debut. The victim is supposed to be one of the guests, and of course the other people begin to become nervous and worried about what has happened to Dick Hogan's character. Where is he? And of course, John Dahl and Farley Granger as the murderers know exactly where he is. And Jimmy Stewart's character begins to suspect that something is very out of sorts with this dinner party. The guests, in alarm over the safety of this victim, not knowing where he is, eventually depart, worried about him. And Jimmy Stewart is about to leave, and there's a housekeeper maid character played by Edith Evanson quite comically and charmingly, who hands Jimmy Stewart a fedora to go out the door, thinking it's his. He places it on his head, and of course it's the wrong size. He looks down and sees the initials of the victim in the hat, and he knows at this point that these two men have done something to this young man. These are about graduate age students, I would guess. Stuart leaves, but pretends he calls back and says, I've left my cigarette case somewhere in the apartment. Can I come back and look for it? Just as they're about to depart and take care of disposing of the body, 
He confronts them, opens the chest himself, sees the body, has an impassioned speech condemning what they've done, and summons the police with a pistol. One piece of this is the very idea, this linkage between murder and moral superiority, has come to them in their student days from Jimmy Stewart's character himself. There's both a sense of revulsion and guilt at his role in this, but also that it's one thing to entertain an idea, it's a very different thing to go through with it. We don't actually get some sort of satisfying denouement, there's no trial or arrest, but uh, Stewart has this great line, he says, the people are going to take action and justice against what these two have done in this murder. Yes, you're right that the conclusion of the play is far from satisfaction. We get the satisfaction that the truth has been learned. The truth is out. It is no longer a secret and it will now involve the people who will do justice. But that makes the play seem like that's what it's working to, whether important things like a murder, the kinds of secrets that are by their nature guilty secrets, will make it out to the public. And at the same time, this means that storytelling is turning into an attempt to tell secrets. That the purpose of the poet is to say those things that people would otherwise not face. Some of them would be hiding it and others would be blind to them. Mm -hmm. And this seems to be why Hitchcock so loved this particular form of establishing a setting. Like you mentioned, in um, 1960s Psycho, which is set in Phoenix, in Rope, 1948, set in New York City. Also in a 43 movie called Shadow of a Doubt, mm -hmm. that takes place both in the city and in a sleepy town suburb. You see the moving from outside to a window and then inside in order to establish the setting and to tell us what the structure of poetry is. Going into people's private lives to make certain things public that need to be public in order for private life to stay private. The revelation of the murder in Rope is done from the beginning. The mystery is not the problem. The true mystery of the play is, how is this possible? What kind of society are we if this might happen in the successful classes in society, the ones who profit most and could be expected most to uphold the social rules by which they have done so well? It is an observation of society, but that requires an observation of private life somehow there's something wrong with the public life that creates this private life. As you mentioned, the three central characters, the two murderers and their former teacher, were all part of prestige schools, the elite prep schools that sent people to the best universities in the country, and they are all intellectuals. That is to say, the people who think that the, the one thing invisible, your thoughts, should be the thing that rules everything in the world, in the visible realm to reformulate the question of what is private and what is public. What is private is your thoughts because nobody can see them unless you share them. But on the other hand, we tend to think of our thinking and its typical product, whether it's our freedom of speech or on the other hand, our science, as the most public thing there is, that which is available to everybody or of right should be. There's a contradiction in here, or at least a tension between the sense in which mind is a secret and invisible thing, and on the other hand, it is the public thing which is available and open to everybody. This is what is dramatized. Which things are secret and which things are not? In which way do we behave because of the things we believe or think we know to be true? And how does that affect our society? The characters themselves are involved in an experiment about the meaning of enlightenment. America from the beginning has been tied up with enlightenment. Jefferson on his tombstone wanted three things inscribed by which his country should remember him. The Declaration of Independence was one, the University of Virginia was another. From the beginning the principles of political equality would require enlightenment education in the sciences, political and natural, above all. And this means that America from the beginning was dedicated to the promise that more knowledge makes for more freedom. And now it has to confront a situation that is radically different. It is still the case that the successful classes that run the country, with popular consent at least to an extent, are defined by their superior education. But on the other hand, the content of that education has come to deny the moral and political equality of human beings because of their intellectual inequality. 
the two murderers are making a claim about getting away with murder. That is to say, they want to prove their intellectual superiority practically. Executing the perfect murder would mean that you can live your life getting whatever you want, and if people don't approve of it, it doesn't matter because they'll never be any the wiser. At least in a secret sense, the wise would be running the joint without any consent from the unwise majority. Hence the introduction of the majority by the signal of the gunshot at the end. It is in fear that justice begins and the alarm. Yeah, and Hitchcock signals several of these themes that you've just hit on in both the set dressing and the dialogue. The play revolves around this nexus between enlightenment and education and art and artistic sensibilities and how artistic sensibilities prove the status of the enlightened one. And as you said, John Dahl's character, he's very conscientious that he has to conceal this murder. He knows that he can't just kill and proclaim it, obviously. He's afraid of the consequences. And he knows that this will give him a sense of superiority. And he wants to let the Jimmy Stewart character in on it, but he's the only person who might possibly really understand what we've achieved here and why we've done it. And I almost invited him in, but you know, he just can't quite keep things under wraps. And the trappings of this apartment in the late 1940s, it was right before the style of modern became the dominant design. And so there's still this lingering appreciation for older artistic furniture, antiques, or reproductions. The home has both modern art and portraits. And also one of the lures to bring the victim's father, who's played by the great English actor Cedric Hardwick, is first editions. There's no concern that the books are of any intellectual or poetic value. It's just that they're collectible status. And so this very middle-brow milieu that Hitchcock ends up criticizing. Also, Farley Granger as this classical pianist, and we'll come back to this later, but he plays a little bit of music. The film has very little limited scoring, and one does not get the impression that he's a real barn burner of a musician, let us say. This tells us something about his talents. These super genius supermen, one wonders what they really do contain intellectually. But John Dahl's convinced they're geniuses, and this is their moment of liberation, is pulling off this perfect murder. Yes, they have this combination of contempt for a Harvard man, which is supposed to show their own superiority. The joke John Dahl makes is, of course, he was a Harvard graduate. That might be grounds for justifiable homicide. Though on the other hand, a resentment that they don't have run of things. They're not as important as they would want to be. Their victim is also wealthier than they are, and this turns out to play a part as well. And you're right that there is something fishy about the pianist. He's obviously not satisfied with doing that. He is not yeah. focusing on his future as a concert pianist. He is, in fact, foreclosing it before it becomes real. Even more so, John Dahl, who is the mastermind, complains about his lack of artistic gifts. He is trying to make murder into an art because there is no other to which he has access. Now, of course, to the extent to which we can think of murder as an art, we could only really think about war, for which you have a military. Police involve sometimes killing, and that requires some training and knowledge, and therefore an art. And aside from that, you could say politics broadly speaking. Think about the capital punishment. The exchange of art, as middle class people understand it, for art in this other sense, which is fundamentally political, taking control over who lives and dies, which is what a political regime does, it shows the ultimate ambition of intellect. You could say that where the murderers start is the common opinion that Washington is Hollywood for ugly people. If you're not part of the talented few, you could be part of the powerful few. If you do not have dazzling, brilliant, or at least glamorous, polished things to wow people with, you could impress them with your power. So also, John Dahl does not have Farley Granger's talent for piano. He has a talent for something that is not attractive to people in the way the piano is. Scheming, manipulation, and murder. He has a superior brain, and he is very resentful because nothing has come to him by it. His dialogue, his scheming, and the opinion of him that his friends have formed for that reason all speak to his desperate desire to show off, to impress them with his superiority. And during the play, he doesn't just play judge, jury, and executioner. He also plays matchmaker. He's trying to take charge of his friends' lives, to rule, at least in this private world, by intrigue and secrecy and crime, because he's not allowed to rule in the public world. This shows one problem with the Enlightenment claim, the claim that more knowledge will bring more freedom, 
implies that the needs of knowledge should be publicly served. Whatever it is that we need to create more knowledge is going to have to be part of the way we live. We need more knowledge for more freedom and so we're going to have to do whatever it takes to get more knowledge. Now, one thing that would uh, take is special rewards for intellectuals, special rewards for intelligent people, special rewards for people who produce knowledge or who are thought publicly to produce knowledge. This character who thinks his natural superiority of intellect should make him a ruler, and if he cannot be a kind of god, he will be a kind of monster, he learned it from the country. This is a modern opinion to have and an American opinion to have and a modern political opinion. We want our politics to be intelligent, to be knowledgeable, to have the facts, to have seen the studies and to be in accord with expertise. But we get a sense from this story as from our own opinions that that's not good enough. We need to consent to wise people ruling us. We cannot simply allow experts to run away with the joint. And this is the problem. Somebody like John Dahl could never get consent for his ideas because the majority would never consent to being tyrannized by the minority. Now, being that only a minority can be knowledgeable in the sense of expertise, doesn't that show a contradiction in the Enlightenment project in America as anywhere else? The more we want expertise, the less we can tolerate the requirements of consent. The more we insist on the consent of the governed to government, the less can we introduce expertise into the common affairs of government. So in that sense, it's natural that things will turn private rather than public, that something secret will happen in an apartment rather than some kind of public confrontation. And I think Hitchcock illustrates this in two very different ways. Joan Chandler is the fiancé of the victim, and she has an old flame who's present. Douglas Dick is, uh, plays Kenneth Lawrence. As you were saying, Hitchcock also shows a defect here in that John Dahl's supposed area of expertise is to be a social manipulator. And when he brings these two people together, he assumes that he's going to rekindle their lost passion and see them led to the altar. And this idea of altar and sacrifice and marriage comes up quite a bit in the film. And John Dahl has assumed that Joan Chandler has thrown over Douglas Dick's character as she once threw over John Dahl's, but that turns out not to be the case. While he's able to manipulate people to a certain extent, he fails to understand them psychologically, and he also fails to understand how much they resent his meddling and manipulation. The other area where Hitchcock begins to tease out some of these political implications of murder is in the conversation when Jimmy Stewart's character arrives. All of the other characters are shown arriving, except Stewart's character, who appears almost in a puff of smoke like Mephistopheles. He lets himself into the apartment and just is there, they lead him into the discussion, which comes to the question of murder and what murder does and what it could achieve in a society. Now, we've already been prepped for Jimmy Stewart's character as an enlightened figure. We find out that he's left the private prep school and has now gone into publishing. And his publishing has been a bit of a disappointment for him. Yes, the Jimmy Stewart character is also a model of enlightenment. He was a teacher to students of the upper classes who are supposed to become the gentlemen of the nation, wielding power from private life, if not from the public necessarily. But also, he's gone into publishing, and he also believes that the claims of the intellect matter the most. He is jocularly talked about as a man so extremely radical that he assumes people not only read, but also can think. And he therefore publishes only things he likes, mostly philosophy, because he prizes thinking above everything else. This, of course, has not led him to any success or popularity. <laughs> that is the mm -hmm. way people show consent in this part of the Enlightenment project, and the people have withdrawn any consent from this man. Yeah, so here's a man who is a publisher of books, and we have David DeCogan's character, David's father, who's a collector of books. And at one point, the ant character, played by Constance Collier, says, well, I've been here for two weeks in New York City and haven't seen anything because Henry just sits in his library and catalogs his books all day long, in which Cedric Hardwick replies, well, occasionally I do even read one, you know. So we have this juxtaposition between a man who wants to publish books because he wants to spread enlightenment and another man who just collects them as a commodity and occasionally dilettantly dips into them. Reinforcing that class issue you brought up earlier, these are the wealthiest people whose son's gone to Harvard. Yes, it fits very neatly. The audience, the James Stewart character most wants to reach, he can't quite reach. 
and the prestige of publishing of education has already been tied up with a certain greedy antiquarianism, getting what is rare regardless of whether it is good. This is easily explained as a class issue and it functions this way in the movie. What is rare and therefore precious can only be had by the people who have money and they are the few. But why should they be interested in the rare? Mostly because nobody else can get it. Now, what the people constitute by their consent is the popular, and the popular in a commercial regime will always be cheap, easily had. It is because the many create what is popular and dominated by their private choices that the few react by collecting what is rare and which is not available to the many. But in neither case do we have a serious judgment made upon what is worthwhile, what is good to publish and to read. The only character who makes judgments about that is James Stewart, and he seems to be torn between a highbrow attitude and a kind of lowbrow attitude. He would seem naturally to be at home among these aristocratic types, very rich upper class people, because he has taught their sons and his sophisticated superior manner goes well with theirs. But on the other hand, he is on intimate terms with the maid who seems to be in his social class and there are somewhat jocular remarks about their possibly getting hitched. He's in between. He is not exactly with the people, although he turns out at the end to be the summoner of the people and therefore of justice, but he's not exactly with the intellectual and moral pretensions of the few either. As you said, he abandoned his teaching career in order to be a publisher. Now, in a sense, that's an American thing to do because it's starting an enterprise and being your own boss. Who doesn't want that? But he's a failure at it because he has taken being his own boss too seriously. An American entrepreneur cannot be his own boss. His boss is his client. And this would be the model for all productive arts. The man who has an art that produces things, whether it's chairs and books or anything else, has to know out of what he makes those things and how to do it. But he waits upon his client to decide what to make. Now, that is the model for productive arts, but not all arts are productive. There are also contemplative arts, and this would seem to fit well with teaching. In the case of the contemplative art, the man who has that art is in a very different situation. He needs to know the things that fit in his art, how many they are, of what kind, and what their relationships are. He is not expected to produce something or to be practical. Jimmy Stewart is caught in between the productive and the contemplative as well, both as a publisher and as a teacher. He takes the productive part of life, publishing, to be a contemplative thing where the only thing that matters is what is worthwhile to think about and he expects people to fall in line with that which they of course refuse to do. But he also takes the contemplative part of life, education. There is talk about his conversations with this young man and he seems to have been much more of an influence on them than their own parents were. And in that contemplative side of life, he has been unduly productive. He has planted ideas in the heads of the children, or they bought from him things that spoke to their secret desires, and this is leading to a catastrophe. He is the intellectual cause of the murder, partly by negligence, and the parents of the boys and the adults of their social class seem to be morally responsible by way of negligence. They have neglected to see what education their young are getting and have also neglected to take a curiosity in their young as intelligent beings. That's what's so shocking and in a certain strange way humorous about the fact that there are all these first editions, there are all these books that are of interest, and the interest is completely independent of what the books are supposed to tell you. This, of course, is also a comment on the movie. Alfred Hitchcock really did put himself in the position in which he shows this character, played by Jimmy Stewart. He produced things that people didn't want to buy. Rope was a flop with critics and audiences alike in a string of flops in the late 40s that were the lowest point in Hitchcock's career. But at the same time, he was ignored as a moral teacher. People did not want to pay attention to what this movie is about and what it's trying to say about class relations in America, about the changes in society now that enlightenment, knowledge, intellectual pursuits are more important, and also about the thing that is, seems to be characteristic of Hitchcock, at least in this period that we're covering from the late 40s through the early 60s. He wants to create a middle-brow art. He's willing to make compromises with his audience to attract them so that they consent 
and pay for his work, but on the other hand he wants to bring to them highbrow concerns and a sophisticated form of analysis of society, of character, of human nature, good and evil, the relationship between the intellectual and the moral parts of our being. One of the things that struck me in preparing for this discussion today is that almost all of the commentary on the film devolves into the technical aspects, which are in some ways impressive. But there's an unwillingness even among, not all of course, but among many Hitchcock critics to deal with the actual content of the films rather than just getting caught up in all of the, the whiz-bang of him as a director. As a result, all of these wonderful clues that he points to all throughout his films become things critics focus on but missing the big themes that he's putting out there just as the audiences sometimes miss them and enjoyed his films for the entertainment because Hitchcock understood the necessity of being entertaining in his filmmaking as well. And he's definitely clever as a director, but people still don't want to come to grapple with some of the themes that he lays on the table. And James Stewart's character does that himself. When they have the discussion midway through the film, the dinner party finally gets going. The topic of murder is introduced and a discussion ensues and there's several reactions going back to what you're saying about the disconnect of the parents, Cedric Hardwick's reaction is one of moral outrage, but he just wants to not hear it. This is something that's too serious. You shouldn't be so lighthearted and jovial about topics such as murder. I don't want to be a part of this, so I'm going to exit the room and go and look at the books. We learn Jimmy Stewart's role as a father figure at the academy also was one of neglect. And we learn very little about these students' backgrounds because they're not important to Hitchcock. Uh, he's not trying to find a psychological excuse. There's no deep, dark reason why these people should be murderers. But we do discover that John Dahl does have this habit of terrifying his peers. And we get two examples. Farley Granger, right after the murder, says well, you know, you've always frightened me, and that's sort of part of the attraction to you as a friend. And Jimmy Stewart recounts, John Dahl liked to tell this 19th century horror tale, the missile bow about a, a bride who locks herself in a chest and dies there because she's not discovered. No one knows where she is on her wedding day. And of course, the man he has murdered is engaged to be married. You're right about the interest Hitchcock has in these young men and this one young woman. They have actually come of age, they're intelligent enough to ask themselves what they want to do with their lives, and they're also neglected and in certain ways abandoned enough that they have to figure it out for themselves. They're autonomous agents to some extent, they're not the consequences of events that are mere accidents from their past. Even what we learn about the childhood of John Dahl is supposed to speak to his character, not to have been an accident that decided his fate. He liked to scare people because he wanted to show his superiority, his fearlessness with respect to speeches, which is a vulgar correlative to intelligence. He is willing to say anything. This is like boys who like to gross out girls. It's a show of superiority because it is a show of contempt, of daring. This is the character he had from when he was young, and the teacher should have known this and not encouraged him to push this further. The teacher again is in a certain sense intellectually and morally responsible. So far we have gotten to the crazy ideas he has put in kids' heads, but there is a certain moral component because he knows who these young people are. We're not dealing with impersonal higher education system where kids are supposed to go through a kind of Brownian motion into and out of classrooms without any core requirements. Here the relationship of education is deliberate and personal. The educator, the older man, is very clever and he is deliberate. His ironic manner and his shocking remarks are all calculated to pierce the shell of respectability of the upper classes. John Dahl tells these his bedtime stories to his housemates, this illustration of his character. But also, Douglas Dick's character remarks that it was master-disciple relationship. John Dahl as a student would sit at the feet uh, of the Jimmy Stewart character. And when Stewart shows up at the party, he, he pierces right through social convention Douglas Dick says, oh, I'm glad to see you. And Jimmy Stewart says, well, why? And so Stewart has the understanding. He should be able to see where this could lead, and yet he is blind to it to a certain extent. There is a lovely piece of irony in his dialogue. The young girl, Janet, who is engaged to the man who has just been murdered, says she hopes he will do her justice. By the way, he eventually does. But he looks her dead in the eye and deadpans. Is that what you deserve? Do you deserve mm -hmm. justice? Yeah. We all believe we deserve justice, that's why we're so proud of ourselves. 
but he brings up these questions that are of a philosophical character to discombobulate, to startle his audience, and to show them that they have made many assumptions that will not hold under scrutiny, and that they are morally and intellectually far feebler than they believe they are. The privileges that come with their social class have not been earned, really. That they cannot live up to the boasts they believe simply because of what they have inherited from their parents. This is done with some subtlety and it's very thoughtful. It is not mere resentment, it is not the shrill criticism of privilege we have today. The man certainly assumes that privilege could be earned. He is trying to educate these children of privilege to live up to their boasts, not to abandon all privilege. He is not an egalitarian in that sense. And this brings up the question of what radicalism means in this play. Twice extreme radical is used. We have already mentioned the intellectual part. The teacher, played by Jimmy Stewart, now turned publisher, is a radical in the intellectual sense. He would like people to buy his books and think about them. He does not want to write those books, by the way. He is not self-important in that sense. His importance, he thinks, comes from the fact that he has read good books that other people could read as well, and he wants to make that happen, both as a teacher and a publisher. He is not self-important as a ruler, and in a certain sense he is sterile. Then we have John Dalt, this other man with political ambitions, who is also sterile, he says. He can't produce artistically, but he says murder could be just as powerful as any art. And as you mentioned, it is Jimmy Stewart who reenacts his old conversations by talking about murder when it is brought up as a tool of society. He says, think about all the problems we could solve. Unemployment, poverty, gone. That, of course, recalls Jonathan Swift's satire, a modest proposal, how the rich could complete their exploitation of the poor so that they don't have to even bother with the existence of the poor. But then he says, queuing up for tickets to the theater. Tickets. Yes, exactly. All of a sudden, the frivolity of social privilege is exposed, and also the root of our requirements for justice in our anger, which depends on our circumstances. It is frustrating to queue up for a long time. People do complain about it. Everybody who calls customer support is in danger of shouting at the representative, <laughs> even in full knowledge that the person on the other end of the line is at no fault himself. But that is the anger where our desire for justice begins. And like he explains ironically to the girl Janet, we all believe we deserve justice. That's why we start doing things that are dangerous. We believe we don't get what we deserve and we want to get it. This inquiry is incredibly thoughtful and at the same time lighthearted, ironic. It belongs in the conversation of a party, for example. It is about the life of the intellect. It's not supposed to be done. But why shouldn't it be done? Jimmy Stewart goes on with trying to shock American morality by saying he is not the kind of extremist who would just run amok and start murdering. He would want it done with ceremony. It should be strangulation day. Cut the throat a week. You sense there the mockery of American advertising. And of course, this brings out the fact that in reality we do execute people. We do at least tolerate the killing of some people without getting very outraged or doing something about it. And the different political parties and their partisans have different opinions about which deaths should be avenged or righted somehow by political changes, but everybody does have that opinion. What's shocking about him is that he's trying to move what is accidental. Some people die unjustly without our intention to have that happen. He wants to transform that into a plan to rationalize politics. This seems to be a mockery of the opinion of the successful classes that they're running society well. Yes, and we know that he's speaking ironically. To help underline Stuart's moral seriousness, we find out that he has a bad leg from the war. And there's a sense, too, that maybe some of this is a little bit of post-traumatic distress as well, that he's also working through this. Yes. So there is something irresponsible in his sense of humor and in his criticism of middle class morality. He's right that the parents of the children are negligent and that in a certain sense society is negligent of the education of the children. And really, if you think about the movie as a social reflection on the tensions within enlightenment, it was a prophecy about what would come in the 60s. After mm -hmm. an age of contentment and prosperity, the children brought up in that age turned out to be political radicals because of what they thought they knew, which entitled them to rule. 
Now, of course, people want to think about the 60s as a radical egalitarianism, and there was certainly some egalitarianism, like the civil rights struggle, and that was all American. But the claim of a new perception or a new knowledge or a new way to rule society is not about egalitarianism. It is radically inegalitarian. And of course, anybody who knows enough about the hippies immediately picks up the social class aspects. Mm -hmm. The hippieism for me, but not for thee. And I don't think this prophecy should be lightly dismissed because both the political and the social situations are described with uncanny accuracy in a movie that could otherwise be dismissed as a whodunit. Mm -hmm. Now, I think this is partly a problem with the way Hitchcock is treated. Nobody would say about something highbrow like Dostoevsky that his description of terrorism or nihilism wasn't prophetic. But in the case of Hitchcock, these arguments aren't made because it would force people to look too closely at their own society. And uh, in that sense, it is better to dismiss them and to look for thrills, or in the case of a movie like Rope that doesn't have thrills, to call it a failure. A noble experiment, but a failure. Then you can talk about what failed in the experiment. But the experiment didn't fail, people just didn't want to notice. Now back to the character played by Jimmy Stewart and his irresponsibility. As you mentioned, he is a war hero. He is, like war heroes war, silent about it, but people do know and there is a certain attempt to tell the young so that they too will know. That speaks not only to his patriotism, but to his moral core. You're right that what he neglects to understand is that that can't be taken for granted, that the next generation might not know. They would have to be introduced to the moral core of society before they can intellectually criticize its failings. Otherwise, their tendency, because of anger and outrage and the demand for justice, would be to reject it. They would only be concerned like these privileged boys are with what belongs to them, with what they deserve, with what they think they're entitled to, and not at all with what duties they might have to anybody else. At this level, it seems like the true question is shame, and this brings out the deepest political reflection in the movie. You have already alluded to the fact that this movie is strangely religious. A trunk is turned into a coffin hiding a corpse and that's tied up with a ghost story and then the coffin is turned into a sideboard to serve food and at the same time a kind of Catholic altar with a cloth on it and candles and the murderer is very much aware of this and he thinks it's very funny to have everybody eat from this place where a corpse lies in waiting He's in a certain sense trying to get everybody to consume that dead man as opposed to, say, consuming the blood and flesh of Christ. Yeah. He is orchestrating a black mass, you could call it. At some point he jokes when he is asked by one of the guests, is this some birthday? How come we have champagne? He says, no, it's the opposite. And that joke is neglected, but that's what he means to celebrate the death day, which is the birth of something new. And this is the most shocking part of what the movie is trying to teach you. This young rationalist, as he fashions himself, is trying to form a new way of running people's lives where killing human beings is not forbidden because there is nothing left that is shameful. He tries to take shame out of human life. It is not just everything surrounding the celebration of a death, the black mass I have described. The murder weapon, the rope, whence the title of the play and the movie, he wants to repurpose for domestic use. This is where his co-conspirator and actual murderer, the brawn to his brains, bulks. He is shocked at how callous the murderer can be about the murder weapon. He wants to hide it. He thinks it's a shameful thing to do. He is scared. Not the murderer. He says, look at it, it's just a rope. It's a domestic article. Anybody is going to just see rope here. And that's why the movie starts with a murder. So it's not a whodunit. You have to see that all of these elements could mean something else. None of the things used for his macabre ritual need to mean what they mean. They only take that meaning because of the moral character of his actions. And that is something that human beings bring with them or in their ignorance could keep secret, hidden, like in the horror ghost story about a bride that was never married because she remained hidden against her will in a trunk. Human beings have to bring their moral concerns and their moral intelligence to an investigation or else something like a murder weapon could be passed around as a common article of use. It is the fact that our moral actions are opaque that calls forth poetry and art like Hitchcock's. 
you wouldn't know. None of us would know what these things really are or what they mean or any of the things we live through. One of the things that Hitchcock is always hinting at in movies where we are introduced to a setting, to a private abode, as we have mentioned, it's most obvious in Rear Window, I guess, is that these are private lives that are going on everywhere. This is just one private scene among many others. A few characters in an America that's full of them. Some are good, some are evil, and the moral drama of good and evil is taking place every day. But people have got to notice it and to begin to be thoughtful about it. Ultimately, the claim of rationality would be shamelessness, evacuating moral character from our actions by making it invisible, making all our actions, as it were, technical. Yeah, speaking of prophetic voice, modern Satanism is an ironic religion. It, it's not like Dr. Faustus and Marlowe. They don't believe there is anything. It's a nihilistic religion that uses the trappings of 19th century romantic ideas about black masses. And so we have an anticipation of that in John Dahl's character with this extreme skeptical enlightenment perspective that has led him into a nihilistic dead end. But what does he do? He refers to the coffin, the chest, this Italian antique, as a sacrificial altar. And he says, I want to lead the guests to eat off of it. There's definitely a parody here of the Catholic Mass. In fact, the number of candles are the appropriate range. He's got three in each candelabra that sits on there. And the housekeeper, who's this ditzy Western Pennsylvania, we'd call her a nebby, a nosy character. She objects to this. She says, you've ruined my table. He hides it as an act of moral courtesy. Well, I don't want the old man to have to bend down and take these books out of the chest, so we're going to move the books into the dining room. And it is in the midst of the meal that the questions begin to arrive about the location of the body, as if by eating from the chest, it gets the ball rolling. Now, Farley Granger is bothered by this, and he resents it, and he's mistaken when his guests begin to arrive, and Constance Collier, who plays this mindless socialite, she can never remember the name of anything comes into the room and she mistakes Douglas Dick for David because she's never actually met David and she just knows he's tall and blonde and she says oh David and of course Farley Granger cuts himself in the hands and later we're going to have a parallel hand when Jimmy Stewart is shot in the hand by Farley Granger and in the course of the dinner party Constance Collier's character takes Farley Granger's hands and says you will become famous because of these hands and of course everyone else thinks she's talking about his potential career as a concert pianist but she believes that she's clairvoyant in a little strange way she is. And the sacrificial act is further extended during the dinner parties. John Dahl says quite boldly that he's seen Farley Granger strangle things. And he paints this wonderful bucolic New England scene. He says that we're in this lovely valley and it's Sunday morning and you can hear the church bells ringing. And Farley goes out and strangles the chickens for our Sunday dinner. And Farley Granger says he's lying. And this is the first clue to Jimmy Stewart's character that something very sinister is going on here, or at least something very strange is that he knows that Farley Granger has strangled chickens. And so here we have all of these elements of the sacrifice, but also the sense that they have to fly from their own sacrifice. As ironic as John Dahl is, he knows they have to get this body out of there, and they're going to retreat to the country, to this bucolic setting. Yeah, and as much as John Dahl pushes in the direction of removing all moral miasma from facts, from things, Farley Granger goes in the opposite direction. Having become a strangler of men, he denies lying, shouting that he had ever strangled a chicken. He can no longer tolerate the usual kind of killing that doesn't carry moral implications. The more he is supposed to be dragged into a future where you can be rationalistic and say killing a man is no different to killing a chicken, the more his guilt and his growing hysteria and insanity pull him back in the other direction. He denies things that nobody could be guilty of because they're not guilty things, mm -hmm. because he has other guilty things to hide that he can no longer tolerate. Both the smarmy attitude of John Dalk and the paranoid, hysterical attitude of Farley Granger are required to clue Jimmy Stewart on to what's happening. He realizes that things are unnormal, that these boys are behaving strangely, and he begins to see why, and starts taking seriously the moral implications of ideas and things that people say. It's strange because it doesn't make for much of a transformation. You don't feel at the end of the movie, and this may be the one dramatic failing, that he has really earned the big speech he makes on behalf of the people. He turns his fight against these murderer boys into something very similar to his fight against the Nazis in the war. 
And of course, this is what the American audience wanted to hear, and this is what they would immediately be thinking about. These boys think they're superior to others and that the superior should kill the inferior for their own advantage. Everybody understands what this would mean, but it's not clear to me that the character has earned this transformation. The movie has spent a lot of time proving that moral instincts and the moral probity of the older people are just useless when it comes to dealing with this evil that knows how to hide itself because there is a certain lack of suspicion. They do not see what is around them and indeed why should they see? How could they see? Well it takes this other kind of character who is somewhat immoral, somewhat compromised himself in order to know what to look for and to know that he should be looking for it. He turns from trying to moralize with decent people who are insufficiently thoughtful to moralizing with indecent people. That makes dramatic sense, but it doesn't seem developed and it just comes very late, pretty much the last reel of the movie. Yeah, it, when I watched the film, that was the first thing that I thought was an artistic letdown. The Jimmy Stewart speech at the end, either it should have been longer to develop these ideas more, or there should have been more of the film to give us a transformation of his character or at least try to come to terms with his responsibility with these boys' education. And that's the one thing that anyone ever complained about. They, they tend to complain about, will the tracking shots go end up the camera gets pointed at the guy's back for a couple of seconds. And honestly, if, if someone hadn't pointed that out to me, I don't think I would have really cared about that. Because Hitchcock, his goal with middle bra art, he talks about creating a true film or a true cinema. And this is an experiment to take a stage play and transform it into a film. As you pointed out in a conversation earlier, a similar attempt had been made in the first filming of the play was it the bbc 1939 a television broadcast yes so i felt immersing us into these characters lives is a perfect foil for what he's doing and i didn't think it was a failure at all and i think it's almost a necessity to deny us the thrills and if you watch the trailer the trailer starts with the only moments of the murdered character dick hogan actually being alive we see him in the park having a conversation with joan chandler's character a very mundane hi how are you oh you know don't kiss me in public oh we'll, we'll be married soon enough and i'm gonna go i'll see you later i've got an appointment and off he goes and we get a voiceover from jimmy stewart that this is the last time anybody is going to see him alive we then get a shot of Jimmy Stewart just talking to the audience, and then Hitchcock shows us every major moment in the film, in sequence, in the second half of the trailer, including the murder. We see the strangulation, and all the way up to Jimmy Stewart calling for justice at the end. So I suspect that part of the failure of the film with audiences in 1948 was his trailer. It gives you the entire movie in miniature. And as if Hitchcock is saying, when you come to see this film, I want to talk about other things. And audiences didn't want to talk about those things. Yeah, both in Hitchcock's movie and in the BBC adaptation of the play, the insistence on very long takes was to keep the trunk where the murdered man is hid as close to the action as possible and to make you feel that you're as close to it in the room as possible, as though you were there at the party, to enhance the moral urgency of the questions that are discussed and to try to bring out what is hidden under being nice. Somehow that failed and you're right that Hitchcock's success as opposed to his genius lies in suspense, in attracting people to evil to make sure that they see something horrible. This seems to be inherently dangerous to the middle brow combination. It's not at all clear that something lowbrow like a murder mystery or a horror story and something highbrow like these concerns about our humanity, the mix of intellectual and moral requirements and faculties, it's not clear to me that the mix really holds. I agree with you that it's strange to see how much cleverness in criticism is expended on matters of absolutely no importance. All the technical details take their meaning from what the movie is all about. When you don't want to talk about what the movie is all about, the parts of the movie don't really cohere. And it's worth to go and see how careful Hitchcock is as an artist, how well he puts different parts together, and what their joining together suggests. As we've tried to show in this conversation, how dialogue, settings, filming, set design, all these things make suggestions that we could uh, turn into an investigation. And there is one element which we have only alluded to now, but it should be the concluding part of our conversation, and that is the use of the importance of music in the movie. It's another show of how thoughtful Hitchcock was, how well he fit things together, but this is your expertise, so I bow to you. 
Thank you. I'm just a church organist, so let's not overstate my expertise. Hitchcock is always very deliberate in his choice of music. And in this film, we do have very little music. We have the opening credits, and it's an arrangement of a Francis Poulon piece for piano, which is then the only other major piece of music that draws attention to itself. And this is played by Farley Granger. The piece itself is one of Poulenc's very first performed publicly in 1918. I think it's published in 1919. It's the first of three perpetual movements. It's interesting to me. I, I wanted to see the score. So, of course, you go online, you can find anything today. There's some recording on YouTube that has the piano score tracking with it. And I downloaded it and played it myself. It's very short. The tempo is interesting. Uh, and, and I thought this was rather ironic. The tempo marking in French translates to fairly moderate. Is this one of Hitchcock's jokes? The, the talent uh, of this character is fairly moderate. <laughs> I encountered Poulenc first time as a cellist playing his Gloria in the university orchestra with the chorus. And even at the time, my first reaction to Poulenc's music is, wow, there's some really interesting things here. There's some parts that are very serious, and there's parts of this sacred arrangement of the Gloria from the ordinary of the Mass that sounds like a can-can. And that's what you see all throughout Poulenc writing, is that he blends a seriousness with a frivolity, an ironic French boulevard attitude, you know. And on the page, the music itself almost looks like an 18th century piece the way the bass line is arranged. And he was a student of Sati, and so there's this very delicate line. And Poulenc's famous for being able to write beautiful and engaging melodies. And the piece is like that. Poulenc himself in later years felt that his early work, including this, was sort of a throwaway and shouldn't be taken too seriously. And he resented the fact that he was often seen as middle brow and not a serious composer. And his music was quite popular in the 1920s and early 30s in Britain. So I'm sure Hitchcock, being a lover of music, knew it. A lot of his pieces were performed by the BBC Orchestra live. And he'd also given a concert tour in 1948. And so the movie where we have these characters who have this intellectual pretension are spending time practicing a piece of music that technically is not terribly difficult. What is difficult about playing that first movement well is that Poulenc wants a delicacy of interpretation and a true emotional insight to take this melody and play it well. Any decent pianist could get through the piece, but to play it really well would take some great emotional and, and artistic sensibilities. It's not a barn baron, or we're not talking a Rachmaninoff, you know, third piano concerto. It's something an amateur could learn to play, but an amateur would play it badly. So this Poulong piece, which we hear in the opening as an orchestrated, and a rich Hollywood-esque late 30s, early 40s style, you'd expect, you know, Eric Korngold to have written an almost rich orchestration when we see the Warner Brothers shield. That gives way later to the piece being played as written. Poulenc himself, incidentally, orchestrated it, the little suite. And this is the piece that Farley Granger is laboring over at the piano. And one would have to think, if he's ready to perform at Town Hall, is this the piece or is he just playing this to satisfy his guests? That's the great question in my mind. Is this a reflection of his artistic limitations or is this a reflection of the taste of his party audience? And it could be a little of both, I think. Yeah, it does seem to belong to the times, to the class, mm -hmm. and to have these humorous implications about the middling character of these supposed great men themselves. By chance, I was talking about this movie rope with uh, Terry Teachout on Twitter, who noticed mm. in the dining room a Milton Avery picture on the wall, a portrait of his daughter. Milton Avery was also a middle-brow artist, a modernist in American painting, but back when modernists were still doing representational painting, and he was admired by later more abstract expressionists, but he wasn't that kind of painter himself. In that sense, he's the kind of modernism that the middle class could live with, and mm -hmm. in the 40s he had acquired quite a lot of prestige, and his pictures would be seen in galleries, in museums, though not this one, this portrait somehow disappeared. Again, it shows whoever designed that set, possibly Hitchcock had some involvement in that too, as with the music. He got the times and the social class and this strange aspiration that you want to be modernist, but you don't want to overdo it and go beyond respectability. That you want something highbrow artsy, but on the other hand, not something difficult or uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. That also fits with your remarks on the music. And I think they're quiet but very intelligent remarks on the situation of the social class and the brittle alliance of art and upper class enlightenment and in artistic taste. And of course, they're the opposite of Hitchcock's own choice. 
Hitchcock's choice was to ally highbrow concerns with the lowbrow genres of the thriller and horror. These are alternative views of the relationship between progress in art and progress in society. Well, Eric, we have talked at length here and I hope we have been entertaining for our audience. This is not a popular movie, but it is likable. It's an enjoyable experience. It is well done and beyond its cleverness, it has moral urgency. You're stuck to the picture in a way in which it doesn't usually happen with thrillers without getting scared. It is a remarkably civilized thriller. Yeah, it's a wonderful film. I'd encourage anyone to see it. Even though it's in Technicolor, it avoids the garish extremes that some people find disconcerting. Thanks again for joining for this conversation. Well, thank you I'm, for having me. We're building a body of criticism here on Hitchcock, and we'll move on to other of his movies when next we get a chance. Meanwhile, all the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>